Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. In a world where rugged and reliable matters, Ruger stands strong. Celebrating 75 years of American-made craftsmanship, Ruger continues to set the standard for excellence in firearms. From the iconic 1022 to the American rifle and beyond, each firearm embodies precision engineering and our deep-rooted traditions. Join us in honoring a legacy built on strength, innovation, and the American spirit. Hey, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. I'm your host, Christy Titus, and we are here with the one and only Fred Eichler from Everything Eichler TV, airing on Sportsman's. And um, not only do you have a TV show, but you're like a really great co-judge. <laughs> well, I was going to say the same. I, I mean, I, I, I was there, so obviously <laughs> it was a good event. Uh, <laughs> that was so much fun, though. Yeah, so yesterday we we hosted the RMEF World's Elk Calling Championships here uh, at TAC at Big Sky. And Fred and I, we were, they gave us a script, and they had the nerve to actually look at us and be like, absolutely do not deviate from the script. Don't be yourselves. Don't say anything. <laughs> don't, don't offend anyone. Just read the words. <laughs> and if you say anything else, we don't have time for that. Don't do it. You know, that was literally the instructions. But it was, you know what was fun for me is us both admiring how good some of those callers were. Because I honestly, I was like, I think I could hang, uh, you know, as we went through yeah. some of it. Like, you know, yeah, that sounds really good. But I think I, and then we got to the upper tier and I was like, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're I'm not just hanging. not that good. Yeah, we're uh, not uh, hanging. We couldn't do it, but it was fun because literally we were both just mesmerized. I think would be the best word for it. Yeah. Well, and in the first brackets, you know, they're doing a lot of like weeding out of, um, you know, toe to toe, you know, mano y mano, and as the as the levels advance, the variance in the ability of the caller shrinks. And so it goes from like, okay, yeah, there's a very audible difference in <laughs> this collar versus that collar to, whoa, this is getting really, really tough to tell who's going to win this matchup, right? Oh, yeah. The cutest was the little peewees, though. I mean, how did that, that just melt your heart watching those little kids come up and the, oh, little, yeah. the little girl with her little puppy in her backpack? Yeah, she like had like a, she had one of those little baby, <laughs> like kangaroo patches, pouches on her, and she had her little dog or teddy bear or something in it and she's up there calling elk with her little oh it was so it was, cute oh and she told me her her little her little pretend dog's name was francesca and i was like that is the cutest thing i've ever seen that's and then she sweet. ripped out a bugle that i was not expecting well she was better than you so yeah, that, uh that's that she was <laughs> just, she was yeah. really good <laughs> yeah. those, those kids were tough. like i would have been in until that little girl called yeah. and then i'm out when she bugled i'd have lost i'd have lost even out you know, <laughs> that blind that would have been yeah just <laughs> blind judging from the judges yeah you were out on that one uh, no, it was it was actually really cute. And then her and her brother a- had to compete against each other. And when they went up on stage, I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, they, uh, yeah, it, I felt bad that they had to compete against each other. But they, they seemed to take it in stride. Oh, it was awesome. Yeah. I, everybody did it. You know, just the, there was so much good sportsmanship there. Yeah. You know, everybody congratulating each other, shaking hands. You could see the competitors like, hey, great job. Man, yeah. you did a great job. It was really cool. I, it really was a fun event. I think I think we both enjoyed it as much as any yeah. of the competitors. Yeah, I, I love coming every year. I would have such FOMO if I weren't here. And, you know, when the competitors are up there, you know, we're standing there obviously all day. And in, I'm prejudging all of these callers as well. I'm like, oh, you missed this sound or you got that sound and nailed it. Um but what I love is, like, the level of respect given to one another. Some of these guys, when they stepped on stage, there was a couple of guys that, you know, gave each other, like, this bro hug. Yep. Um, like, hey, man, either way, I respect you, you respect me, because it is so difficult to come up there and be infallible on yeah. those series. Oh, like we talked about, one slip of the tongue, the reed <laughs> moves just a tiny little bit. <coughs> you know, there's so many things that could go wrong. Yeah, they pop a latex and... Um, 
Yeah, it does. Uh, Which is always bad. Is, uh, you know, Fred, I was really trying. Here. I, I, was, I, was I was trying. I was trying. I was I'm trying. Sorry. Really trying. I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, it um, yeah, it's it's crazy how competitive it gets. And this year was just super crazy. It's one of the first years, you know, Corey Jacobson hasn't been either the world champion or second in the world. Bo Brooks has taken that title the last couple of years, and then even Bo this year, um, as talented as he is a caller, he he ended up I think in third. Um, it, it just the the competition is getting so tough year to year the judges are back there it's completely blind they don't know who's calling and they're listening for for something that's almost impossible which is to say you're better than you and and these guys are also talented it's crazy i wouldn't want to be a judge no i mean i, I you know i see the difficulty I, I you know it would be fun but i think the pressure for the judges is every bit is as, as much pressure as it is for the for the callers as well you know i think yeah. there's a lot of that and then you you brought up a great point it's so tough at that level yeah you know it, it really it could go either way because you know we, we both heard elk that don't really sound like elk yeah <laughs> so it's the well it's like the pro rodeo of calling because if you think about some of these timed events in pro rodeo like one tenth of a second can deem the winner or loser right you know and, and i feel like it's the same thing when you're watching these guys call it's like one tenth of a second you want to you know what i mean and because they're so good at that level yeah i, I see i see what you're saying yeah i mean it's, it's unreal and w we need more women calling but the three women that showed up between the three of them there was 11 world titles between the three of them and talk about a championship of championships with those three ladies calling up there toe to toe. It was really unreal, um, because all three of them had had so many world titles already to their credit. And um, all three were super talented. Super Everybody, talented. Everybody though. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the, you couldn't say one person wasn't good because really every single person that got on that stage, was from incredible. the pee wees to the pros, were incredible callers. I mm -hmm. mean, I, you know, I would hunt or you know let let any of them guide with me. You know, to, like I was impressed. Yeah. The other thing I like about <clears throat> this whole event too, on the elk calling side, is you have the manufacturers there, um, and these guys are the ones that are setting the tone for our success in the field. Um, and just to see that healthy competition amongst call companies, you know, you have all these new brands that have stepped into the market. You know, we have kind of that tried and true Rocky Mountain hunting calls, but then we also have, you know, kind of that, that Riven uh, is, is brand new on the field last year. We've got Slayer, we've got Phelps, and those were kind of the dominating names. Um, and you're not really seeing the Primos anymore. You're not seeing the HS anymore. You know, some of these other other calls that were, you know, 15 years ago have kind of phased out and, and the new call companies are coming on the market and they're innovating all the time. And, you know, you saw a lot of the kids up there with, the, you know, Slayer's new um, mouthpiece that you can actually push a button and do cow-calf talk and then snap it on your bugle tube and bugle with it. The, you know, kids that don't have to use a diaphragm were just rocking out that, that call this year. And, and um, you know... It's crazy the, the level of competition, you know, Riven coming in with the wooden bugle, which everybody's been doing plastic and aluminum and, you know, all of these different composite type materials. And then Riven comes out last year and is like, no, we're going to do wood. And it sounds incredible. <laughs> it sounds great. And it's, you know, kind of a keepsake. You can notch the wood and, and, you know, and then there's obviously that Rocky Mountain hunting calls, which has just made a great product um, from, the, from the beginning of elk calling, really, and, and it has a ton of world championships to their credit. And right. the healthy competition that's among these companies and these competitors, um, it's really awesome to see. Yeah. And how about the people that with no, with no diaphragm, like I wanted, I, I was like, how are they making those cows, mm -hmm. those sounds with their mouths? Yeah, the kid that won that, Sam Wolcott, he, he won the Pee Wees a couple years in a row. He aged out of Pee Wees. He entered voice. And won his third world title in voice. And, you know, yesterday we, we saw him calling his grandpa just teary-eyed. Grandpa, I did it again. <laughs> I'm a world champion for the third year in a row. And he's just a little kid, you know. It's so crazy. Cool. We had one kid who's nine, and he's been calling since he was like, oh, I think he said he was four or something like that. God. I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, your whole life you've had a call in your hand pretty much <laughs> since you could, like, move. <laughs> That's amazing. It's no wonder these kids are so good. In the heart of the wilderness, every step counts. No matter where or what you're hunting, Onyx Hunt Elite has you covered in the U.S. and Canada with offline capability, land ownership, 3D mapping, and you can even access specialty courses, hunt research tools, and elite-specific features. No matter where you pursue the wild, adventure is assured when you upgrade to Elite for the ultimate hunting experience. 
it, that's what's ridiculous is they've started so young. Their parents, and, and you called out the parents that are teaching yeah. those kids to do that, which is really cool because yeah. it really is. It's a neat thing for, you know, you know fathers or mothers to teach their children and to, you know, <laughs> carry on that, that heritage. And, and elk calling and, and interacting with any animal is fun, whether it's a coyote, you know what I mean, yeah. an elk, uh, you know, a deer, you know, a turkey. It's, yep. it's, it's all fun. I met two little girls yesterday. And, and both of them were so inspired by watching the event. They're both coming next year. One little girl was running around here, and she had little kitty cat ears on. <laughs> and she, she, um, she's like, well, I saw a video of her. She's like, let me show you my most prettiest bugle. And she's got her cat oh. ears on, and she's blowing a bugle. And, and then another little girl from California, her brother competed. And she's like, next year I'm coming, I'm going to win. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> I mean, I just love the enthusiasm that's, you know, this sparking in these little girls too because we really need them participating in hunting because, uh, you know, obviously as they get older, you know, women have so much influence in families and households, as you know. Um, you have kids you've raised that, you know, might not have been as interested in being in the field if it wasn't a family thing, right? No, right, 100%. <clears throat> And you're really mean to your kids when you go hunting. So I'm surprised they still hunt with you. I am too. After I listened Even to some clients. of your stories yesterday. I know. I'm, shocking. I'm, I'm rough. I'm rough. Uh, happy Father's Day, by the way. Hey, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. Your kids survived. Yes, I know. Amazing. They're all adultish age now. So yes. you're... You made it. And then I, me and my sister even have a competition to see who can call our father first, so, yeah. which is always fun. Oh, yeah. So I won this morning. I Did was you really call him at 2 a.m. when you I, got in your I room? Called him, I called him at like <laughs> 6.30 in the morning. Yeah. And I'm like, Dad, happy Father's Day. Did my sister Did my sister call you yet? He's like, no. I was like, yes. yes. Tell her that, yeah. I, that I obviously love you more, and that's why I'm your favorite. So, yeah. so it's, a fun, it's a fun thing. It's a fun thing. So do you have any advice for parents on, on uh, you know, that have young kids, you know, surviving uh, number one, them growing up and, and, and then also, you know, helping them thrive. Well, you know what, to me, it's, it's, it, it's having fun. I'm th probably the toughest thing for me was I'm so hardcore. Like I'm like, Oh, let's go over the next mountain, you know, and let's, let's, let's go do this or let's sit out here all day. Yeah. And I think you can burn kids out on that really quickly. Yeah. So, and, and you know, I think there's such a fine line between, okay, you're right. It's not about the elk hunt or the deer hunt or whatever we're doing. If you want to, if you want to sword fight with sticks, let's sword fight with sticks and stop okay. hunting. You know yeah. what I mean? So, yeah. so to me, my dad was way better at that than I am because I'm so into it that there were times that I had to go, okay, they're they're freezing to death. We're walking through two feet of snow. Yeah, they're not having fun anymore. Let's 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 goof off. Let's yeah. you know let's let's not worry about trying to harvest the animal and let's make it about their day. And so, uh, you know, I would say to me that was probably the best thing my dad did for me and yeah. that's why I still have a passion for it yeah. and, and, a, and a love for it and I think that's one thing that um I like to think that I I got better with with age with my kids yeah. of let's goof off let's you know yeah. what I mean if you want to sword fight and stop you know stop deer hunting then let's that's sword fine. fight and if we want to bust out laughing and scare off every deer or every elk you're, on the mountain you're cool with it let's do it which is interesting because I was talking about you behind your back yesterday uh-oh um and <laughs> <laughs> And we were literally talking about, like, you come across as, like, this super high-strung guy. And I can be very high-strung, but I have an off switch. And we were talking about you, and I was like, dude, that guy has no off switch. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling, like, I can judge you from the outside looking. I'm like, there is no off switch. He is hardwired. And for you to turn that switch off and go into relax mode with your kids, I bet you that took a little while. It, it, it did. And, and like I said, that was something that I had to learn. And, and, yeah. and it's because, you know, you know, I love those boys so much that it's it was literally like, a, okay, you've got to kind of go against – your personality almost, yeah. you know what I mean? Because I don't want to burn them out. Yeah. I, you know, I don't want to, you know, but they're all, they've all turned out amazing. They've all got great work ethics and they're all great hunters and they're tons of fun. So mm -hmm. it's, it's worked out really well. Yeah. It's worked out really well. Yeah. And they, um, <clears throat> Fred has gotten to this age in his life where um, his kids are not laughing at him when he gets off bucked horses anymore. <laughs> they actually <laughs> they are checking worry. him for signs of life and broken bones. You should tell this story <laughs> because this is like the progression of you know your kids and you're getting older because your kids aren't like, ha! Dad just got bucked off. Now they're like, ah, Dad, that is was, your lung punctured? Yeah, yeah. Did you break a hip? Did that you? was that was literally the reaction I had the other day, and I, I was I was telling Christy, but it was so funny. Uh, we were working cattle, 
and I didn't lunge my horse. And, you know what I mean? I, you know, he was he, he, he was ready Spicy. to roll, and I hopped on him, and he just friggin' went nuts. And there was a time I would have just tried to ride him out, you know what I mean, whatever. And there was a time that if I got booked up, the kids would have all laughed, you know what yeah. I mean? Ah, you know, yeah. But, like, I came off, landed on my side, you know what I mean? And, and literally, tra- are you all right? Are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. But it was just like, yeah. man, that switch, that, 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 that's, that started to switch, which is funny. It's a funny, funny transition mm-hmm. where it's like, all right, they're worried about me, which I guess is good, right? Well, I mean, they yeah. somewhat care, I guess. Yeah, they, you know, they, they, they were like, the of ranch love. is ours. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Finally. I'm in the well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, There's so no good. probate. Yeah, right. We're going to move right forward. <laughs> so that was And a- it's sad that I know that word. <laughs> I mean, that really is an indication of age as well. <laughs> You're concerned about right? probate. We, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is a bad deal. Yeah, you know what uh, I mean. Yeah. No, um so that's good. And I agree. Like I was really fortunate when I was a kid. Um boy, and I got to say, I'm really lucky. I grew up kind of when I did because I was such a boy growing up. Uh, today, I think that would be really confusing. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was such a boy, and I did all boy things. I had no girlfriends. I was into riding horses and hunting. And, I mean, my dad let me just dig in the dirt and 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 learn to saddle my own mule and kind of overcome things. And, I mean, I wouldn't be where I am today without, without my dad. So this is kind of, you know, a big tribute to all the fathers out there, you know, because you really I, – I listened to Miranda Lambert's dad the other day, and – and he said, you know, the most important thing you can do as a parent is move with the bend of your child. Whatever they're into, whatever they're bent towards, and God will give everybody a bend. And some people call it purpose, whatever. But go with the bend of your kid. And, and my dad always let me go with my bend and let me just be, I was a feral animal, you know. And <laughs> here I am. Nothing's <laughs> changed. <laughs> That is a neat way to put it. I'm, yeah. I'm, I met Miranda Lever's father at the NRA show. And He's a, super, a heck of a guy. He is a nice, yeah. nice man. Yeah. Huh. But obviously very proud of his daughter, but, you know, of course, but super, super nice guy, really yeah. down to earth, and I, I really like talking to him. Yeah, I had a great time getting to know him and <clears throat> hearing a little bit about their family story. and But, you know, kind of the takeaway from that was he, you know, when Miranda came to him and was like, hey, because he was in music, and when she came to him and, and had the same interest, he didn't have to push it on her. She was natural at it, and I think that's so important as parents, too, to recognize, you know, to go with the bend of your kid, yeah. you know. And your kids, you know, thankfully for you, they're kind of interested in the same stuff you're interested in. You know what? That's the biggest compliment I think there is if your kids want to do what you want to do. So, you know, the oldest is into the farming and, you know what I mean, the ranching and the cattle, you know what I mean, all that good stuff. The middle one wants to run the outfitting business, you know what I mean, which is huge. And the youngest one is a competitive pistol shooter and yeah and, and enjoys uh you know the rifle and handgun stuff so it's kind of neat that they're all kind of in that outdoor space if you will yeah i met your one kid at the hornady booth at nra oh yeah trent yeah yeah, yeah. he's a lot of fun they're they're all you know they're all unique and and you know to your dad's credit he let you do what you want to do yeah. if he would have tried to force you to be you know a ballerina, you know, it may not have gone as it well. It would have been very disappointing for everybody. <laughs> I don't think he gets any ballerinas out there. I mean, there. I'm, I'm built saying. for comfort, <laughs> okay? Um, <clears throat> I'm a good, I'm great hunting because I'm not coordinated. So team sports was, I was out, you know, I was sidelined. <laughs> I was not playing any sport as a kid. That's the great thing about hunting and shooting sports, too, is you take a lot of kids that don't, they're not that, you know, football player or cheerleader or ballerina or basketball player and you put a, a bow in their hand or a rifle in their hand and a lot of these kids are in in high schools earning letters you know, for their high schools by participating in shooting sports and archery and there's a lot of great programs yeah. in archery i mean bear archery is a huge supporter and obviously we both shoot for bear yep. um and and making sure and, and part of fred bear's legacy was to create bows that everybody could enjoy time in in space in the field with and that's you know that's what that's what's important. And he probably impacted more people, Fred Bear did, oh, yeah. to get him into bow hunting than I think anybody, anybody ever has. That's right. Ever has. And he was such a great spokesman for the sport. Mm-hmm. You know, he was just a super guy. I was very fortunate to meet Fred several times. Mm-hmm. And he was such a unique He would stop and talk to you and make you feel like you were the most important person in the world. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and he wasn't. You know, he wasn't one of those guys that looks around you, you know, to see if there's somebody else more important he needed to talk Boy, to. Boy, and I have seen that and <laughs> right, experienced right? that in this industry so much where it's like, I'll talk uh, to you, but as soon as so-and-so comes in, that's right. more, yeah. 
but, yeah. and, but for there's Ed, a lot of that you know and i think that's in probably every sport or every industry but but fred wasn't that way i mean when he was talking to you he was talking to you and and he respected you and you didn't have to be somebody important or you know i was you know i was a kid you know what i mean and he made me feel like man you're just the mm-hmm. coolest you know and and you love to bow hunt and tell me a hunting story like just a really really yeah. nice man so i love that you i love you gave him props and brought up fred bear because mm-hmm. he is uh that legacy still lives on oh 100 percent. and and i mean he really united not only archery but also archers and and rifle shooters and, and rifle hunting because he was never the guy that was like pinning one against the other he was always the diplomat and and that can go so far today yes. people really should listen to that a little bit more yes. and, and take heed and, and being that diplomat like if hey rifle hunting's not for you and bow hunting's not for you or you know whatever like let's all be on the same team yeah. and have a collective voice because we're all in it for the same reason the the best ad campaign ever done was be a two season hunter and, yeah and to your that point, was fred's campaign that, that's exactly right that was fred's mm-hmm. campaign and it was a uh, Hey, you don't have to do one or the other. Like you said, yeah. you know, it was a big tent theory and it was, Hey, you can be a rifle hunter and love rifle hunting and you can also shoot a bow and it just gives you more time in the field. That's right. And, and to me, that was like, that was such a great message. And like you said, people can learn from that today. It doesn't matter what you're shooting or, you know, I, I don't care if you shoot a crossbow or throw a spear or shoot a rifle. We're, we're all out here yeah. because we all are passionate about the outdoors, mm-hmm. and, and that's what it's about. It doesn't matter what, how you get out there. If you're a kayaker, a mountain biker, it doesn't matter to me. But if you're enjoying the outdoors, then, then we're on the same team. Yeah, and it, it's probably – I can't even imagine the level of honor it is being in your position having known Fred and, and kind of looked up to Fred to now you have a namesake bow in the in the Fred Bear lineup. You know – I mean, that's that's pretty incredible turn. It it was it was emotional for me. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, I, I, honestly, because you just put it very well. Uh, he was, uh, to me, a legend. Still is, always will be. He mm-hmm. was a, a, a mentor in a lot of ways, and of course, my father is my main mentor. But, but Fred Bear, as far as a bow hunter, was like the guy, the man. And yeah. I, you know, I grew up reading his field notes, and you know what I mean. Everything he wrote, and watching his old TV shows, so. When they said, you know what I mean, we were going to work on a project, which was Fred Bear's original latch design, which mm-hmm. was so far ahead of its time. I mm-hmm. mean, it's still relevant today. Mm-hmm. No tools, take down bow is still relevant today. So what I wanted to do is, like you said, it was an honor, but it was also a very delicate thing because I didn't want to change Fred's design. You know what I mean? To, you know, it, it was an incredible design. I just wanted to tweak it a little bit. You know, as we have more technology and, and, and can make some subtle changes to the bow to make it a little more tunable, um, change just a few subtle things. Yeah. And it was really an honor. Yeah, to have my name on, on a bow that with Fred Bear's name on it, it, it was it was absolutely incredible. Yeah. So tell everybody a little bit about your bow uh, well, that's listening and watching. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's a takedown, um, which is, again, Fred Bear's original last design. Um, one of the things I wanted to do, and a lot of it was because of Fred Bear, is... The, the flat shelf, Fred recognized that you didn't want as much surface contact on your arrow. Um, so they would do little things back in the day, like they'd slide a little piece of wood underneath their shelf, you mm-hmm. know what I mean, to get that to get that arrow with less surface contact yeah. on the whole shelf. So what we did is we made three different setups on the shelf that you can put in and, and change literally the bevel on your shelf, you know, how much arrow is sitting on there. Uh, we also changed the side plate a little bit. There was one screw that you could adjust. Um, I set two screws up that you could adjust and then lock it in exactly in, in the same spot. So one of the biggest things on it was the tunability of being able to do that. You know what I mean? That was that was huge. You know, and then we lightened the riser up. We made a few, you know, just aesthetic changes as well um, on the on the handle. I went with a smaller handle. And what I wanted there was just something that seats in your hand the exact same spot every time. Yeah. So it was really a fun, fun project to work on. Um, I love it. And and like you said, it's one of those things I, I comment sometimes on video that it feels like Fred Bears, you know, you know, with me, you know, to be what I'm in the stand sometimes. So mm-hmm. thanks for asking about it. It's really been a fun project and uh, and it's going really, really well. There's a lot of people that are uh, that are picking up the bow and, and loving it because it's still Fred Bears design. But we've made it a little easier to tune. 
And to your credit, you're one of the only people, if not, I don't know, the only person that has the North American 29 with a recurve. Yeah, I think there's uh, there's been a couple other people now. Uh, but it was, you know, it was such a neat deal for me. And it, it didn't matter to me if I was the hundredth person to do it, the first person, the last. I, I wondered, Chuck Adams was the first one to complete it. Yep. And he named it the Super Slam. And I wondered if I had what it took physically and mentally to do that, mm -hmm. you know, and, and as an avid hunter yourself, you know, there, you know, when you're in the field chasing some of those animals, it is a physical and a mental challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and everything's a mental challenge to me. But well, was I wasn't going to go there, <laughs> but since you did, <laughs> thanks for pointing out the obvious. <laughs> but that it was, it was so much fun for me just to, you know, when Chuck Adams did it, I thought, man, I wonder if I could do that. Yeah. And so for me with the recurve, it was just, it was fun. And, and it was just such a, it was such a neat thing to, to go after and, and learn about different places different animals yeah and do you have a favorite like if you were to look at all 29 and people ask me that all the time like what's your favorite animal to hunt and you're like okay well there's they're all different for different reasons but there has to be something for you um as a hunter that's kind of monumental to you or something that is just kind of key to your spirit or yeah something like that yeah you know i commonly say to that question that it's whatever I'm hunting at the time yeah. because I'm such a passionate hunter that if I'm hunting rabbits, rabbits, my favorite Yeah. because I'm hunting rabbits, you know, and if I'm hunting squirrels, squirrels, my favorite because I'm hunting squirrels right now or elk or whatever. But yeah, the ones, you know, the ones that certainly stand out are the ones it's never the easy hunts. Yeah. Right? It's type two fun. Yeah. It's yeah. always the hardcore ones where you're exhausted. You've lost 10 pounds. You're on the mountain. You're freezing to death. What hunt and, is that? Because I need to book it. No, really. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's most of my sheep and yeah. goat hunts. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, the grizzly, I guess when I think of Fred Bear, some of his iconic footage was brown bears, grizzly yeah. bears. And especially back in the day, doing that with a, with a traditional bow. Uh, I think was just amazing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if if I was to say, you know, some of the big stuff that could eat me, you know, whether it was leopards or, or a lion or polar mm -hmm. bear, grizzly bear, brown bear. Did you hunt leopard some, with a recurve? Some of those, yes. Wow. But 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 some of those stand out. You know mm -hmm. the you know I shot a big grizzly bear. That's a you know uh, you know I, I have a claw representing the, the grizzly because that to me is like really cool. And Fred bears. Yeah. You know mounts that were iconic or a lot of those hunts like the brown bear and Kodiak. Mm -hmm. Those are the neat ones. Yeah. That's one of uh, that's been on my list. And I actually, I tried to book one and then it's just gotten so difficult to get in on these hunts. They're booking them so far in advance. And then, then, and then I started adulting a little bit more like, Whoa, Christy, <laughs> did you check out the price on those? Right. <laughs> Maybe you need to take a backseat on that for just a minute. And they're getting so they're, it's expensive, crazy expensive now. And, um, and, it's and almost a shame. It really. is. It is hard to have some of those opportunities, um, yeah, to hunt those those bigger species. And in Canada anymore has really gotten to where you better have a real big pocketbook to head up there and hunt anything um, anymore. It's, uh, it's crazy. I was fortunate because when I did it, it wasn't near no as expensive. And I also traded out a lot. Being an mm -hmm. outfitter, which was great as a lot of outfitters are, are hunters yeah. as well. So I would do a lot of swapping. You know what I mean? Hey, have you ever wanted to kill an elk or a mountain lion or this mm -hmm. or that? You know, so I would trade hunts out. So, you know, I think I did the cheapest uh, Super Slam probably in history uh, wow. just because I did so much of that. And I also, you know, I, I shot at the time, it was, I shot more of a self-guided than anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, because when I could go on something self-guided, you know, whether it was moose or, you know, sick of blacktail or, you know, all the species in Colorado you know, I have, you know, bighorn sheep, mountain lion, a lot of things that, you know, goats, a lot of things people needed guides for, um, which is understandable. Yeah. I was able to, to go by myself. So mm -hmm. Colorado's unique in the fact that we have almost a third of the Super Slam right there in Colorado. Mm -hmm. So Shira's moose, you know what I mean? I, you know, a lot of those you can do by yourself. I'm trying to draw those. Yeah. Keep putting in. Keep I'm going to, I, you the know The point what? creep's getting bad the though. Point. So my big thing is four years ago, I laid it down the money on a fan and sheep so I can try to get my, oh, my, nice. my gray sheep. Yeah. So I've got a doll. Um, and I'm, I'm that. So next year I'm going, I'm going for my gray sheep and, um, I, it's like a one shot deal. Oh, that's going to be awesome. Cause the price has just gotten, you know, and, and it's doubled in four years, the, the pricing of that stuff. Are you going rifle bow? What are you? No, I'll, I'll go rifle for okay. sure. Nice. Um, just, I mean, I'm not, as diehard as you are in the archery side. So I'm, I'm happy to pick up a rifle in, on that hunt. I have no issue taking a rifle. Oh um, gosh. Yeah. No, yeah. So be awesome. I'll be rifle hunting there. And, um, 
but that's that's been a big okay I'm gonna get there you know one of these days and yeah so and then I'm hoping someday I draw a desert or a big horn or you know especially a Wyoming resident my my cousin has lived in Wyoming for two years same time out of time as me and he drew a sheep tag this year I'm like you've <laughs> got to be kidding me you little punk <laughs> did you ask him if it was transferable well and then <laughs> before we moved out of Oregon he drew a once in a lifetime goat tag I'm like what kind of horseshoe do you have floating around your head right now because I wow <laughs> like he, yeah so um but I've been I'm lucky I feel like I've, I'm lucky I have killed some some northern species that are pretty awesome like caribou and mountain goats and and the one sheep um and and you know, it's like it's like a one and done. They're one time experiences. Although I did do two caribou, two she, uh, goats, but um, you know, unless I draw Colorado or something like that, I won't. I probably won't ever harvest another goat again. Uh, just the pricing, you know, it's like yeah. okay, well, you know, once you have that experience, some of it truly is once in a lifetime, and, and or one in ten or more, even sometimes, because not everybody has those opportunities, and um, it's it gets tougher all the time. Yeah, you know, but like you said, the, you know, the game is, and that's what I did, you know, with my Rocky Mountain goat, with my bighorn sheep, you know, with, you know, Shiras moose, with a lot of those, uh, I was putting in for draws Yeah. all over the place, you know what I mean? And, and when I got lucky enough to draw, then it was, you know, then I would go and I'd go self-guided, you know what yeah. I mean? I've been self-guided for caribou, moose, you know, a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's a really, um, you can really get a lot of it done, you know, and there's some, of course, you can't, you know, unless you're a resident of Alaska or, you know, or some other place, but there's a lot of, you can still do self-guided uh, which is an awesome way to go. The other thing is saving. Um, the, like I said, my sheep hunt I booked like four years ago. And, you know, people say, wow, well, I'll never be able to afford that. And, it's, and I literally look at people. I'm a huge Dave Ramsey follower. And I look at people and I go, well, do you go to Starbucks? And they're like, yeah, <laughs> I, I, go to, I love Starbucks. Okay, well, you eliminate Starbucks for four years and you will darn near pay for your hunt. That, right, exactly. I mean, it's that. Or going that, out to eat. Yeah, or, well, yeah. I mean, that's extreme even. I mean, but um, if, oh. even if you did no food <laughs> out for four years, yeah, you'd have that hunt. Um, but it's, yeah, it's 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 those little things of just paring back and taking that money and reallocating it into other into other avenues and setting different money aside. It, it is actually really achievable for people. It might take you three or four years, like it has in my case, to, to do some of these more destination hunts. But in my priorities, right? Like, where's your priority? Do you, do you want to yeah. have a brand new truck and you're going to spend 90 grand for it? Or are you going to be like me and you, you drive a, you know, a six, seven year old truck that's paid for? <laughs> and yep. guess what? You know, you're saving money every month and, and instead of spending it. And so it's just it's figuring out if there's a will, there's a way for sure. Um, but it is it is a lot more challenging than it used to be. Oh, yeah. No, 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 for sure. I would agree with that. But like to your point, I think there's a lot of things that you can do. It's easy to make those little sacrifices. And, you know, gosh, no, as I, uh, I grew up in ramen, ramen noodles and minute rice and squirrels, you know, to be not, because I wanted to apply all my money yeah. to that. And, you know, macaroni, I, cheese. Yes, you got it. Corn and elk. That was my <laughs> childhood diet. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. But that was a great point. I whether still love macaroni you know, and cheese. <laughs> not, to, not to pick on Starbucks, but whether it's Starbucks or eating out. And, yeah. You know same, what I mean? Yeah. You know, there's so yeah. many things you can oh, do. Yeah. So it's about priorities. And, mm -hmm. and like I said, putting in a lot of people don't realize. I mean, you can you could probably shoot 20 out of the 29 species in the Super Slam if you put in for the right draws and, yeah. and you know, did things like that. Mm -hmm. You can really go or, you know, even I've even gone out there to say if you have a cancellation, you know, do you have any deals or do you want to swamp something out mm -hmm. or can I can I do this for you? You know, I've worked for guys before yeah. just to trade out hunts. So, like you said, it's about the priorities and, you know, I think you can still get it done. It's just going to take take some time. There are a lot of Americans that understand the value of hunting, but we all know that right now, national support of hunting is extremely volatile. It seems that with every passing day, our voice is diminished and the court of public opinion is not effectively hearing our side. We need advocates working on our behalf in Washington, D.C. to defend our freedom to hunt. And thankfully, when we need it the most, we have that advocate in Safari Club International. SCI's world headquarters are located in Washington, D.C., just blocks from the United States Capitol, which means that SCI is on the ground with our congressional leaders and federal agencies on our behalf, on behalf of the hunting community. SCI has an active political presence in all 50 states through their extensive chapter network and government affairs staff. If you have ever wondered why you should be a member of SCI, you shouldn't wonder anymore. 
Join us in the fight to defend hunting. Go to safariclub.org to learn more. Just has to, uh, you, project planning. <laughs> project planning. Project planning. I like that. Uh, yeah, I like that. Or, yeah. you know, the other trick is, that you know, I did this a long time ago. I didn't have money to put in for the tags, you know, as you put in for all these, for all these draws. So I got a credit card and I would put in for all the, all these different hunts all over the, all over the country. And then when I got the refunds back because you wouldn't draw, I would pay off the credit card. Yeah. So it was like, okay, cool. I don't have the money for this, but I'm borrowing to to put in for all these tags and then I'm going to put them in. And if I draw one of the tags, okay, I'll make that work. Yeah. Well, in New Mexico and Wyoming are both really expensive states to apply in because they require that full payment up front you know and it is it is not cheap um but it is definitely rewarding when you when you do draw Uh, right it's worth it so um, and if you get that money back that's what i mean i've I've told friends of mine like that before they were like how'd you have the money to do that i'm like i didn't i didn't i got a credit card and i paid for them and then when i got the money back i'd put it back and pay off the credit card yeah yeah no i uh I don't carry debt. That's one thing in my life. Like the only debt I have is, is my property, uh, real estate and everything I own is cash. And that makes it a lot easier when I'm not making payments on all these things to really save money. Um, and, and try to be, you know, a good steward to that. And then it's easier for me to look at myself in the mirror, like, okay, I, I put away 5,000 bucks this year just by not doing X, Y, or Z, uh, or sacrificing that. I quit drinking a year and a half ago. And, um, I can tell you, I save a lot of money not drinking, especially really? these Don't events. Don't you get dehydrated? Well, I know. <laughs> I know you have to have Corona. To, <laughs> you have to have a Corona to survive. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's really incredible if you think about how much people spend, you know, just on something simple like alcohol. You yeah. know, uh, you save so much money, put that money away. Yeah, you and know? you could go on a lot of us. Yeah, if you figure out what. Yeah, you know. whatever the deal is yeah. that you can cut. Um, Wendy's. Oh my gosh, people spend. Uh, 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 Wait, where I'm did Wendy's big, come from? I, well, I'm not a big fast food guy. If you were a Randy like Newberg, saying, I would say Dairy Queen. Yeah, but Dairy I mean, Queen, well, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you go, I went to Wendy's the other day. I say that because I don't usually buy fast food. And it was like 20 bucks. Yeah. I'm like, what? Yeah. Like, it's crazy. Yeah, it is. Everything is so So expensive. you could cut out things, yeah. to your point. Yeah. Project and, save. Yeah. <laughs> so is there anything that's on your list that, I mean, you've accomplished so much as a hunter. Is there anything on your list that you're still like, man, I, I want to do this? Man, I want to do it all again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just, I, 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 I enjoy so much and, you know, I enjoy it all. It, it really is. I enjoy, you know, even some of the challenges of waterfowl hunting with a bow. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I've shot geese and pheasants out of the air. And, you know, those are fun. It just depends on what season it is and, and, and chasing different stuff. So I Wait, put in. Let me just take a pause here. I've shot geese and waterfowl well, out of the air. <laughs> well, <laughs> Who does that with a bow? Like, what? <laughs> but it's like, I mean, it, don't, don't get me wrong. It's not like I'm going out there just smoking them all down. But yeah. I mean, it's just like when you make it happen, yeah. it's really cool. So, How many times do you miss when challenge. you do that? I mean, just out of curiosity. So, you know, it's like 30 bucks an arrow. How much is this going to cost you for that goose? Well, I use flu flus. So okay. they come down. So okay. I can I can recover the arrows. Because, okay. yeah, if you look at an arrow with a broad head anymore, you know, you're, you're shooting $20 out okay. there every time. Yeah. So yeah. I have... I, 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 up There's a technique to this. Flu flus, so they just go up a little ways and they come down, so I can recover my arrows. Okay, but it's fun. Yeah, the last time uh, a couple years ago uh, with with my son Seth, we went out and uh, my second arrow I missed the first time went through a feather on a flying goose, and then my second shot smoked a goose, and I was like, "Well, that was pretty cool." So um, I want to go do more of that. Yeah. I want to, you know, I like the, you know, I like the small game, you know, with a bow. So you know, when you say, "What do you want to do?" I, I guess I want to keep. Chasing the elk in the mountains, keep, you know, putting in for tags, drawing stuff and having fun. Yeah. I amen to that. I, I mean, I can't, there's like, for me, um, I, I, there's never a year that I'll ever want to miss an archery elk season. Right. Like, I mean, that's just, that, that's, gotta uh, have it. you gotta have that. This is uh, without compromise. Like we're archery elk hunting. <laughs> like that's <laughs> happening every year. It, and, and I have had people ask me like, what is your, what is your favorite hunt? And, and that is probably of everything I've done. I, I still say that's my favorite. And that's one of the reasons I moved to Wyoming is, you know, I've got my mules. We do the backcountry thing. My dad moved. And, and now we can go and we can hunt elk, you know, general. And I can pack in with my mules. And then and then I'm hunting with my best friends, which are my mules, and, and my dad and my husband. And, and, you know, it's great. And, and it's it's like being home all the time. And, and it's it's the best. I don't have to travel out as much and, you know, go on these non-resident hunts as much. And I'm just maybe home. And, like, sometimes I'm hunting and I, I go out and then I drive home and sleep in my own bed. I'm like, this is unreal. This is great. This is, I don't have to have a tent. 
can go home tonight. I get to my truck and I'm like, well, I could pop up a tent or I could drive 30 minutes and go home. I think I'll go home <laughs> and have coffee in the morning in my kitchen. <laughs> Love it. That's what's you know? great about the West is being able to, like I drew a Wyoming public land out tag yeah. last year and shot a you know, beautiful bull. But, you know, like you said, you can hit those public land areas and over the counter there's still a lot of areas you can yeah. draw. And, you know, it's just it's Wyoming's just getting tough for elk. It takes, I think, five points now to draw general. And Colorado just changed. Yeah. Literally, their over-the-counter archery tags, which everybody went to Colorado for that. So it's going to be interesting to see. I, I kind of hate that they did that. Um, it'll be interesting to see the impact that has yeah. on the on the state and certainly the revenue stream. Which, to be honest, I don't I don't think they've they've done enough research on that to see yeah. the impact that's going to have on small businesses. Conservation budgets as well. Oh my gosh! You know, small businesses, hotels, restaurants. You know, uh, meat processors, taxidermists. You know, all the different people that that uh that funded so it's gonna yeah. be interesting to see what it does to the state I'm, I'm 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 a little worried about that yeah it's incredible we um in it, we, and even just like a, a little rifle match in my hometown of casper you know it, it brings in over a half million dollars in revenue to that town i mean if you look at hunting as a whole in a state we're talking millions of dollars in ecotourism, if you will. Um, we're, you know, and that's in addition to what we're donating and contributing towards PR plus uh, statewide tags, licenses. You know, the the impact that hunters make on conservation as a whole is. Um, there is nothing to replace it right now, system-wise. Oh, right, and just the economy in general. To yeah. your, you know, like you said, not only licenses and 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 hunts, but also all the other people that that money trickles down to, yeah. like the hotels, restaurants, gas stations, everything. Yeah, everything. It, it it really is a, a huge part of the industry and economy. And um, you know, look at where we're at right now. Uh, we're at Big Sky, Montana, and this is primarily a hiking, mountain biking, you know, outdoor recreation area. And now, you know, we we bring in, I don't know, was there a thousand shooters here this weekend? Oh, it has to be. Look at all the um, trucks. It's awesome. It's insane. And and that, and I know I'm spending at least 30 to $60 a meal here. Yeah. <laughs> it's expensive to eat. So the amount that, you know, archers are impacting this community is really tremendous as well. Um, everywhere we go, you yeah. know, it, it is impactful in, in really positive ways and, um, yeah, it, it doesn't, it, it's incredible, uh, w without hunting, there is no conservation as well. And, and without shooting sports, there's no conservation. And, and we are so vital to the whole ecosystem of economy and stewardship of land. Um, we can't be replaced. I agree. I, I, I hope a lot of the departments start looking at that economic impact because I think they need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It is easy to devalue us because, you know, the maybe politic politics don't align with what we're doing. And, and you guys in Colorado are really fighting for predator management right now. Holy smokes. Oh, yeah. I, I, um, there's some mortality rates that uh, Colorado Parks have done. And black bears are the number one impact on uh, fawn elk and elk calf yep. survival rates. Um, and those bears are just brutal on them. And, and what you guys are trying to pass some in Colorado with bears and mountain uh, lions, it's just... And the mountain lions can be the devastating. Impact, yeah, yeah. It's, it's huge. It's well, and you own a ranch. Yeah. You probably see it all the time. All the time. Yeah, multiple elk, multiple multiple bears can, can really have a huge impact um, you know, on your game populations as people don't understand that or people that are passing laws that don't understand that. If we just listened to the biologists, mm -hmm. we'd be set because most biologists understand that. The game wardens understand that. I think what happens is when we start voting with emotions instead mm -hmm. of sound science, mm -hmm. that's an issue. And, and at that point, I say, fire all the biologists if you're not going to listen to them yeah. and, and, and hire a marketing department because yeah. that's honestly what you need because, yeah. you know, I think sometimes people are beating us at the ballot boxes and it's not based on science or sound wildlife management and that's a, that, that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. There's, or, you know, if, if you can't base that on anything, there's not a hunter that I know that, that wants to hurt any population. No. Every one of us would stop hunting anything if it was damaged. But the days yeah. of the passenger pigeon and overshooting and things like that are, are long gone. Yeah. That's why we have game departments. That's why we have wildlife biologists. That's why we have population studies. But when we're not listening to them, we're there's an issue. Well, and a lot of it is wildlife commissioners. Um, yes. And those are appointed by the governor of each state. And those wildlife com commissioners ultimately make kind of the decisions on what happens. And, you know, when we have commissioners that lean the wrong way or have or the wrong perspective. Or, yeah, uh, yeah, they are anti-hunting. <laughs> um, it really affects 
their ability to hear what biology science is saying and these biologists are saying so that's you know that's something as individuals we have to really pay attention to who our wildlife commissioners are um and but unfortunately they're either governor appointed so or fortunately depending on where you live um yeah but let's talk a little bit about your outfitting you've been an outfitter for over 30 years that's that that's a that's a fact it's been a long time and i love it it's uh, you know guide for a little of everything whitetail mule deer uh elk bear uh antelope mountain lion and turkey so do a little bit of everything in colorado there and uh it's it's a great lifestyle. You're never going to make much money as an outfitter uh, unless I'm just doing it totally wrong. Yeah. But you know, by the time you know, with insurance that you have to carry, and you know what I mean, the, you know, liability insurance and all mm-hmm. the equipment and all the fuel and you know, guides and cooks and food and you know everything, it's not something that you make a lot of money on. But it's it's a way of life. Yeah. That I absolutely love. Um, you meet some amazing people, and it's very rewarding. Yeah. It's very rewarding. And uh, so I really enjoy that. I've got people that have, you know, hunted with me 30 years, you know, and, and come back every year. I took a I took a guy, I got to tell you this, I took a guy on his 26, I think it was 26 turkey in a row with me this year. That's insane. Never missed a spring. Guys never missed a spring. 26 years we've hunted together, and it was really, really cool. Yeah. But I will tell you something funny. I said to him, I said, man, this is so neat, you know, 26 turkeys in a row. Let's 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 keep doing it. And he's like, I said, we need to do another 26. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you know, that's not going to happen, right? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, I might yeah, time out yeah, on this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, I might time <laughs> out. So, but it was funny. But it's, it's, it's fun, and those are the experiences that are, that are great. And, yeah. and the kids have all helped out with the guiding, and, and Seth's kind of taken that over. And, and that's a fun experience for them, and they've kind of grown up in that, in that industry yeah. with a lot of really cool people, and you make some great friends as you know oh a hundred percent like your best friends and your best memories are in the field and and going on these trips and hunts and that's one thing that I love about what I do I have control over who I spend my time in the field with and and I don't make time to go anywhere with anybody that I don't want to be around that's (laughs) precious as an outfitter you 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 know don't really have that luxury but you can decide who gets to guide them (laughs) oh yeah yeah. you can be like oh (laughs) guess what you're going with this guy (laughs) he's horrible or annoying or whatever you name it uh (laughs) Like, oh, man, I'm so great. busy this but, year. I'm so booked. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. I really fall. <laughs> yeah, you just let somebody know what I do there. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah but, but most of them are great. 99% of them are great. Uh, but, yeah. yeah, if there's that personality conflict anymore, I'm real quick to be like, all right. Yeah, yeah you're, you're going, you're gonna with go with him tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> or, I, I feel sick today. I don't know. I got a little stomach thing going on. I, <laughs> woo. <laughs> okay. And that's one thing too. I, I think a lot of people don't recognize like uh, when you're a professional, like you as a as a guide or as an outfitter, or even like for me and and my cameraman, um, when we go on these hunts, we don't have the luxury of getting sick. Right. Oh yeah. You like you go. get sick. You're still putting your boots on in the morning and yeah. going, yeah. Uh, because there's there's no making up for that time. The season is is finite. You're gonna do this. Yeah, you're going. Yeah, I can I can just see. I mean, I've had I've not had this happen to me personally, but I've heard of people that have gone with people, and their guide has had too much to drink at night, and they're late in the morning, and you know they pay for a big hunt, and I I'm like man. That is refund worthy. <laughs> I like, had that happen in Alaska. Yeah. I was passed out in the tent, couldn't even get up. And I'm like, I paid you really? a lot of money to be here. What kind of, but I mean, I think those people just don't have repeat clients. No, they don't. You know don't. what I mean? They and don't. that's, that's, it's, but it's like any industry, right? Yeah. There's good and there's bad. That's I mean, right. There's, there's, there's good car salesmen and there's a car salesman that'll rip you off. Yeah. Which <laughs> is why you've had, uh, shockingly, 26 years of the same client. Uh, I'm just teasing you. <laughs> 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 uh, sorry, I had to throw that one in. No, that was good. In. That was that good. Touche. Touche. You know, uh, but it, it does. It does. I mean, the, the, the outfit that come and go quickly in the industry it, it is it's, it's because they just lack all of the things sometimes and we were sitting there listening to stories last night <laughs> from the Eastmans and they were talking about um just horror stories on on a hunt of you know their their guide's car getting stolen and like all I mean just like one thing after another I was like oh my gosh like this stuff does happen it's really weird I mean like, I, if my guide's car got stolen, I mean, what do you do? I mean, this is a weird situation. <laughs> How but, do you handle this? <laughs> but it's also the guy's responsibility. Have you ever had your car stolen? I mean, no. okay, well, that's, that's good. That's probably, that's a positive yeah. thing. But to me, it's the guide's responsibility, the outfitter's responsibility to make that flow. Yeah. You know what I mean? You've got yeah. you, to anticipate 
uh, you know, a horse getting hurt or yeah. you got to anticipate a four wheeler breaking down or a truck breaking down or, you know, any situation you yeah. can have. And you got to either have a backup or a fallback, a plan A, a plan B, a yeah. plan C to keep people out mm -hmm. in the field and doing what they're supposed to be doing. Well, and for you, because you are doing horseback hunts, that's a whole nother level of responsibility. Oh, right? yeah. Like and I don't you. do those as much as I used. I yeah. used to do a lot of those, but most people don't ride anymore yeah. and they don't realize the work involved oh my gosh so although i love doing them yeah. myself uh, you know it, it got to the point where i would take clients on horseback hunts and they were miserable and yeah. i'm like wait a minute this is what you wanted to do you booked a horseback hunt yeah why are you you know you didn't think it involved getting up early getting on a horse and riding a few hours like in what, the dark yeah what I, I don't understand so yeah you know anymore most of the horseback stuff is 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 my hunts because that's what yeah. i really enjoy doing yeah um if i have the right person i'll take about on, on horseback yeah but not it, it is I kind wore of a out dying sport if I you will wore out or, on that. yeah yeah, I um I deal with my own and I it's it's exhausting. Um, the last two years, you know, living in Wyoming, we're doing so many DIY pack trips and it is exhausting. Like when I first moved there, I've always packed with my dad, so my dad and I, are, you know, we go together, and that's just the way it's been my whole life until I moved to Wyoming and my dad can't make every trip because I'm going so frequently, and I'm like, holy smokes! Like, you know, my cameraman's filming, so although you know they they do help um ultimately like when it's your animals and your tack and your stuff it's everything the responsibility is on you to make sure you don't forget anything right. there's nobody to cross check you and <laughs> and make sure that everything goes smooth and, and that you're taking is, care of your animals it's a lot of yeah. it's a lot of work actually i bought a I bought a mare horse, a little filly this year because the last two years my mules you know if you put the wrong two together they're not going to stay in camp for example Last year, uh, my horse is—he's an Arabian, so he's thin anyway, and he—he he tends to wear thin in the in the fall. He's in his twenties now, and so I, I'm actually semi-retiring him this year. But last year, I'd, I thought I'm gonna turn him loose all night so he can eat, just because he's so thin all the time. He's just hard to keep weight on, and his best friend, my other mule, got loose, and the two of them took off. And in the morning, I heard the horse whinny. Well, we also happened to be on a on a good bull. I wanted my dad to shoot. It was right outside of camp. My dad's like, well, should we go get the mules or the horse and the mule? And I'm like, no, we're going to go shoot this bull. <laughs> Let's <laughs> leave the animals. They're fine. They're not <laughs> They're not going to go anywhere, Dad. We have all these other ones tied up to the tree. They're buddies. They're going to stay. And so we go. My dad shoots this bull and can't find the mules. So we, we had rented a couple pack mules because we were short on heads last year. And I ride this my old mule down, and we load up, we you know cut up his elk, and we go to pack it out. And the little pack mules, the little rental mules, were not one of them would pack meat, the other one wasn't having it. Well, the other one you couldn't ride, so I ended up walking back and packing my old mule because um, little rented mules we couldn't we couldn't ride. And so we get back to camp, and I'm trying to find my horse and my mule. They're nowhere to be found, and I'm looking at my cameraman, my husband, my dad, me, this elk. I'm like, what are we going to do to get this thing out of here? We're missing two heads. Luckily, we found them. But, I mean, they went miles uh, before we found them. And so I'm like, uh, now, because I try to rotate them every two hours. That's the other thing I was doing is, like, every two hours I'd wake up and switch lead ropes and catch one, turn one loose so that they're eating every 12. And so now I bought a little filly, and I'm hoping that and mules tend to really mare up, and I'm hoping that I can turn the mules loose and keep the filly tied up and they'll stay with her but man i just don't trust them my level of trust is like i just <laughs> there ah but it's exhausting like people don't realize okay i'm i'm not sleeping a full night's sleep i'm waking up every two hours like a nursing mother uh, at a rotational graze because heaven forbid my mules get a hobble sore <laughs> on their front legs from hobbling them you know it's filmed or you know something like that you, you've really got to be careful on how you handle your stock because the perception of video you know, with sores and all of that stuff weighs on you you know and, and then when you go and lose them oh, that's just terrible <laughs> I was, gosh I'm like what are we gonna do they're gone thank god we got them oh my gosh like we rode down in this valley, and the two of them just run up to us like, hey, guys. Like, oh, thank God you guys are here because I didn't want to walk out. <laughs> like, like, put up wanted posters everywhere. Horse and mule. I actually met a lady the other day, and she puts a little bracelet on her mule's legs that has her phone number and information in case she loses them. <laughs> it's actually pretty smart. I mean, 
you know, you talk to people and the, the breakaway gets broke and they got, you know, a bunch strung out behind and they don't notice it for a while. And <laughs> how does that happen? I heard it happened. I, it's never happened to me, but yeah. it could happen, it's, I guess. Kids you know? have ever lost one. <laughs> no, I, I temporarily lost mine last year. This goes to show you why I'm not a professional outfitter. <laughs> like, we don't need the mules. Dad, shoot the elk. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> And then Tim's back here behind the camera like, I do not want to go in the woods with this lady next year. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> but it is a thing, yeah. Uh, but, and it, an, hunting with animals is rewarding, but it is a lot of work. And my husband gets so annoyed with me. He's like, these animals are so, they take so much time away from the hunt, too. Uh, because there's a lot more to take care of. Yep. You know, so it is, there's That's always a, that trade-off. Facet. Yeah, another always big trade-off. Um, so, yeah, anything else you got coming up, like, exciting New, I mean, your show airs on Sportsman. It's always exciting, you know. I, you know, got some tags this year. I uh, drew Kansas, which I'm pretty excited about. Hey, me about. too. You hunt white Did you really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah drew yeah, Kansas. Yeah. And then, good. You know, always have a bunch of Colorado tags, which is fun. And then, you know, I got, you know, trips planned kind of all over, you know, a lot of different whitetail hunts. I like going down south, too. Uh, my dad lives down there, so chasing hogs and whitetails down there, too. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some bow fishing this summer. It's all it's all fun. Always got stuff planned. Yeah, no, that sounds good. Um, so people can watch your show on Sportsman's. Do you do a lot on social media as well? Then I do. We have an Instagram page, Facebook page, Twitter. Um, you know, and then uh, you know a really active YouTube channel that's uh, that's going well. We put a lot of cool stuff, a lot of skinning tips. A lot of people don't know how to skin you know different animals so i try and show people you know how to you know whether it's coyotes or bobcats or wolves or even alligators whatever you know just you know how to break out down quickly in the yeah. field things like that so a lot of tips tactics how to kind of inspiring empowering content yeah just try and you know have fun you know to try and teach a little bit you know because that's that's how we all got taught you know learning or watching other mm-hmm. people so you know i try and put some of that out there and and just fun you know a little bit of a little bit of tips and tactics you know things that have worked for me and and might work for somebody else yeah well i sure appreciate you sitting down with us today um i have to admit you're one of the funnest personalities like <laughs> we are really keeping things calm here <laughs> we've been I, I just, so hard all i just want to say that the listeners out there We're um, very, we've been very we have been very professional and and people would probably really want to hear the unprofessional side, but we're gonna we're okay. gonna keep it reined in today. Uh, <laughs> that's part two. <laughs> the next podcast, um, we'll we'll do that. Um, and I love that your cameraman is a woman. I just I have to. Uh, yeah. It's Lauren, right? Yep. Yeah, I have to give her credit. Um, I I really enjoy the stories of you falling and her laughing at you. Um, and um, also, I also love the stories of her carrying all the camera equipment and you just walking around with nothing in your hands like a princess. That's and so, that's so I I, I'm like, <laughs> this, she's, I have these big burly dudes and you have this little blonde as a cameraman and she's the cutest thing. Um, uh, tougher than me. So, yeah, that's, that's Well, it doesn't helped. take a lot for yeah, that. Well, that's I mean, true. That's true. true there's you know? So, I, I'm learning one. that that... <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you're a good sport. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of fun this weekend, and I sure hope we get to do this again next year. I do, too. I would love it. Yeah. So what are your handles, just really quick, Is uh, for so your social media channels? Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, I have a Fred Eichler YouTube, Fred okay. Eichler, you know, fan page on uh, Facebook and Instagram. Okay. Are you guys, give yeah. Fred a, a listen, a watch. Uh, check out what he's doing. You guys are going to want to follow this guy. You are so funny. Um, <laughs> we've had a blast. A yeah. lot of, of behind-the-scenes chuckling. Yeah, a ton. So, and thank you all for tuning into this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. Check out Fred's bow from Bear Archery. What is it called? This is the Fred Eichler Signature Riser. Okay. That's what it's called, the Fred Eichler Signature. That is easy to remember. Thank you all for tuning in. And we will see you next time. This is Tack at Big Sky. When conditions get tough on a mountain hunt, your gear must be tougher. Making every opportunity count means selecting equipment that will not fail. Any condition, anywhere, Hornady Outfitter ammunition is designed to perform. Available in a wide range of cartridges from 243 to 375 Ruger. When you're looking for a hard hitting, deep penetrating bullet and cartridge that performs in the most rugged environments, look no further than Hornady Outfitter ammunition. Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. 
If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.